Hello, welcome back to episode 4.3, Assumed Vector Dependence and Pointer Disambiguation of our video course, Parallel Programming and Optimization with Intel Xeon Phi coprocessors. In this episode, we will talk about some of the problems you might get while using automatic vectorization feature of the Intel compilers. Vector dependence is a condition in loops that requires that loop iterations are executed in certain order and not independently. Loops with vector dependence generally cannot be vectorized neither by the compiler nor manually because SIMD operations are possible only if loops iterations are independent. This code listing demonstrates a case of true vector dependence. It is evident that in order to compute a of i, we need to know a of i minus 1 beforehand. So, it is impossible to vectorize such a loop due to true vector dependence. However, there are cases where it is impossible to determine at compilation time whether vector dependence exists or not. Common case scenario is when compiler creates object files separately and or independently for different source code files. In this case, pointers passed from one file as a function arguments implemented in the other file are not known at the compilation time and therefore cannot be checked. In other words, this usually occurs because of ambiguity of the address space mapped by pointer-based arrays. For example, in this listing, function my copy looks completely benign. It seems to copy the values of elements of array B into array A. However, this function may be doing something very different if pointers B and A are aliased, in other words, if they map different parts of the same memory region. For example, if pointers A and B are shifted by a single element in the same array, pointing to the neighboring elements. In this case, function myCopy will populate the array with the elements equal to a minus 1. This requires a very different executable code than a simple memory copy. By default, the compiler must produce executable code that correctly implements the corresponding high-level language code. Therefore, to be on the safe side, the Intel compiler refuses to vectorize the loop in function myCopy. The vectorization report says loop was not vectorized and mentions multiversioning. The loop will be implemented in the executable code with scalar instructions, which may be slower, but at least they will produce correct result whenever or not pointers A and B are aliased. Sometimes the compiler will refuse to vectorize loops because of assumed vector dependence, even though the logic of the application is such that there is no vector dependence at runtime. If we are certain that A and B will never be aliased at runtime, we can tell the compiler about it. This can be done with this statement pragma if dep, which we can place before the loop. Here, if dep stands for ignore vector dependence. As we can see in this case, the compiler report shows that the loop is vectorized. When we override the compiler's analysis of vector dependence like that, we are risking that the compiled application will produce incorrect results if vector dependence actually occurs at runtime. Therefore, pragma if dep may be used only if we can control the pointer variables in vector loops and guarantee the absence of vector dependence at runtime. Pragma if dep applies to an entire loop. However, in complex loops, some pointers may be aliased and others unaliased. In this case, using pragma if dep will result in incorrect behavior of the code. There is a more fine-grained approach to pointer disambiguation in C and C++. This approach relies on keyword restrict. Keyword restrict may appear in the declaration of a pointer, especially a pointer-based function argument, and it promises to the compiler that no other pointer maps to the same memory region. In order to use the keyword restrict, we must compile the code with the argument dash restrict. We can see in the compiler report that the keyword restrict in our example achieves the same result as pragma if dep, that is, our loop with assumed vector dependence is vectorized. So far we discussed how the programmer can point the compiler to automatic vectorization opportunities in the code with pointer disambiguation. Another case when such compiler hints may be helpful is library functions used in data parallel contexts. To assist automatic vectorization, the programmer may make those functions SIMD-enabled using compiler hints. 
Consider this example. Once again, we're adding two values together. This is a simple example which we use for clarity. In fact, CMD enabled functions are able to handle much more complex workloads. The function MySimpleAdd is going to be used in a loop where its arguments are pulled from two arrays. You can imagine that if we inline the body of the function in this loop, this would be a candidate for automatic vectorization. And indeed, if the body of the function MySimpleAdd is in the same source file as the loop that uses the function, the compiler will inline the function automatically and the loop will be vectorized. However, what if the function is in a separate file? This can happen, for example, when we are dealing with a library function. Library code will be separate from user code for security and modularity purposes. In this case, the compiler will refuse to vectorize the loop in the user code. Moreover, library function will only have scalar implementation. However, this is a case where CMD-enabled functions can come to the rescue. In order to make the function MySimpleAdd CMD-enabled, we have to declare it with a special qualifier that reads underscore underscore attribute underscore underscore bracket bracket vector bracket bracket. This qualifier tells the compiler that this function may be used in a data parallel context. The compiler will compile the CMD-enabled function twice, once to implement addition of scalar arguments and another time to implement addition of short factor arguments. Now, because the compiled library with MySimpleAdd will have a scalar and a vector implementation in the function, we can expect automatic vectorization in user code. Indeed, when the compiler sees the code that adds two arrays together, it will realize that this loop may be partitioned into 16 or 8 wide vector iterations and executed with the vector version of MySimpleAdd. We only need to give a hint to the compiler that vectorization is expected by placing the line pragma cmd before the loop. Alternatively, instead of using scalar form of the function call, we can pass slice or whole array as the argument using array annotation we discussed earlier. In this case, compiler will once again use vectorized implementation of the function. Only pure functions may be declared and used as cmd enabled. This means that the function must not modify any data outside the scope of this function, such as global and static variables. For more information and examples of using CMD-enabled functions, refer to this Colfax research publication, zeonfi.com slash papers slash cmd lib. This concludes our introduction into expressing data parallelism. We have discussed where the vectorization may be used, how to automatically vectorize appropriate loops and array expressions with Intel compilers, and how to diagnose vectorization with optimization report. We also talked about assisting the compiler with automatic vectorization using CMD-enabled functions and pointer disambiguation. We have not yet talked about optimization of vector loops, which involves data structures with union stride memory access, memory buffer alignment, and specialized programming techniques to expose vectorization opportunities. We will revisit those subjects in the next chapter. And now we will continue with the subject of expressing parallelism and discuss parallelism on the level of multiple cores, in other words, threat parallelism. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope to see you in the next episode.